This is Photo How To, and I'm here to help with camera settings, tips, and tricks. Thank you for subscribing to this channel. I hope you find this video beneficial. If you do have any questions in relation to this video, or camera settings, or camera gear, please leave a comment down below. In this video, I will be looking to take you through some of the best settings to get you started shooting with your Nikon Z7 II. I'm just gonna show you how I would set my camera up just to get you started. And hopefully you'll find this useful and take some of those tips away with you when you start shooting. Okay, so what are we gonna be looking at? We will be looking at some of the amazing features in the menu, including focus modes, white balance, ISO settings, picture formats, and I'll also be taking a sneaky peek look at video formats too. I'd recommend grabbing your Z7 II and having it with you, because as I go through the camera, you may decide that you wanna change some of the settings yourself because these may benefit your style of photography. Here's the standard Nikon menu. Uh, anyone that's used with Nikon cameras before, you probably recognize it. Simple format, nice and straightforward to use really good to navigate. Down the left hand side of the menu we have a number of small icons. Uh, when you highlight these they will identify different menu options. The first one we're going to look at is the photo shooting menu. File name. This is quite a simple thing. You may decide to leave this at the default setting. That is entirely up to you. However some photographers do like to personalise this with either their initials or some fancy name. I'll leave mine the way it is. That's not because I'm being lazy, it's just because, yeah, let's be honest, I am being lazy. <laughs> uh, sometimes I do change these. I have on previous cameras just to identify the camera. It makes it a little bit easier. To be honest, I really do this when I'm editing videos because then I can identify which camera has been used. It's a lot quicker for me. But in this instance, I'm just gonna leave it where it is for the moment. Our next selection will be the image area. You can select whether you want to shoot in FX, which is full frame, or you could even go down to DX or one-to-one -one square. You've got a couple of options here at your play, but I think most people opt for FX mode. I'll show you full frame, I can then max them on the scope for editing shots, the size that I require by cropping, etc. Following on, we pop down to image quality. You decide here what format your images will save onto your memory card. You can select RAW, JPEG, or RAW, and JPEG. There are lots of options in this menu. If you do not plan on editing your shots, I would recommend selecting JPEG Fine Star for the best quality. However, if you plan on editing your photos, then select RAW as this retains all the detail in your shot, which then can be used in editing software to create your final image. Now, let's take a look at image size. In this section, you select the size of your JPEGs and your RAW files. If you select large, this will give you the maximum megapixel count, which is what I use as I want to retain the best quality when shooting my photographs. You can do this for both JPEG and RAW files, depending on what you previously selected. The next option is RAW recording. First, let's take a look at RAW compression. Here you will have an option to select lossless compressed, compressed or uncompressed. This will depend on the amount of detail and quality you want in your RAW files. You also have the option to select RAW bit depth. You can pick between 14 bit and 12 bit RAW. I'll select 14 bit. We now pop down to ISO sensitivity settings. In here you can manually change your camera's ISO. There is also a shortcut button located on the top of the camera which you can also use to change the different current ISO settings. Let's take a closer look at this menu. The first option, ISO sensitivity, is where you'll manually change the current ISO settings. Directly below, you'll also select auto ISO, which will let your camera take control of your ISO sensitivity, depending on the lighting in your current frame. To explain a little more, I will only use auto ISO when my subject is usually moving from a dark background to a light, or vice versa. The camera will quickly detect the change in lighting conditions and compensate by either reducing or increasing the ISO. If you are new to photography, I would recommend turning this on until you're comfortable with changing your settings manually. If you do decide to change the maximum ISO sensitivity control, make sure you select the ISO sensitivity to 64, providing a benchmark for lighting conditions when you start shooting. But you'll need to bear in mind using a higher ISO will also increase the noise in your image. Finally, here is a useful tip. You can turn auto ISO on and off by pressing the ISO button on the top of your camera and using the front bell to scroll through on or off, which will show on the display as ISO A, which is on, or just ISO, which is off, which means you're then in full control of your ISO settings. White balance. To be honest, for 99% of the time, I leave white balance in a default setting at auto. You can also shift the auto to create a cold or warmer look to your images. You can click on auto, which takes you into a sub menu. 
If you want to create a warmer look, then select Auto 2. However, I prefer my images to look a little colder, as I like to rely on a natural ambient light to create warmth in my photos. Next, we look at long exposure noise reduction. This is a useful setting if you're shooting landscapes or in a low light condition, when you may be shooting for longer periods. By turning this on, it will reduce any hot pixels created by your camera while shooting. You will also need to take into consideration that the noise reduction option will mean when shooting for 20 seconds, for example, you will need to allow an additional 20 seconds for noise reduction to work. And what is a hot pixel? A hot pixel is basically a little white dot where the pixel has been burnt within your image. And to be honest, you will not notice this unless you zoom right in on your photograph. And yeah, to be honest, you can get rid of them with spot removal if you use Adobe Lightroom, for example. Now, metering as a mode that you will change or leave in a default setting. There are four options. I mostly use matrix metering. This will give a good reading for most of the frame. The only time you may look to change this is when you have, for example, a bright highlight background, like the sun or sky, directly behind your subject. Then you will select spot metering. Wherever the focus point is in your frame, the camera meters from that point. For now, I would recommend leaving this in matrix metering to give you a wider spread and good coverage with lighting. The final option in the photo shooting menu is the AF area mode. This is where we tell the camera how it will focus. For the most of the time, I use single point focus, placing the small square on my subject so that it remains in focus and sometimes blowing out the background with a low aperture. There are plenty of other options, such as wide area autofocus, which I've used for tracking larger birds in flight or cars moving through my shot. There is also the option to select wide area autofocus for people or animals, but this will be covered in a future video. For now, start using single point focus, but remember, you will need to use the arrow buttons on the back of your camera to move the focus point around your frame. Otherwise, your subject may be able to focus. When you depress the shutter button on top of your camera gently, the camera will automatically focus on the area where the focus point is located. There is an advanced option for back button focusing, which is a quicker method of focusing. However, I will go into this in more depth in another video, but I am gonna to touch a little bit more on this later in this video. Next, I'm gonna look at the video shooting menu. This is where you change most of the settings for video recording within your camera. You'll note that some of the options are the same as the photo shooting menu, but to be honest, I keep them the same as the photo shooting menu. Whatever you've selected there, do the same for the video. Now the first option I want to look at is frame size and frame rate. Here you can select whether your video will be shot in 4K video or 1080p HD. You can also select the frame rate you would like to shoot in from 24 to 120 frames per second. If you are shooting in 4K, obviously the file size is going to be bigger and it's going to take up more memory on your card need to bear in mind because it will go very very quickly depending on your card size so having a good spare backup is a pretty good option there are two movie file types you can select from you can either go for mp4 or mov if you're planning to edit your videos i would recommend checking the video format compatibility with the software you're using before selecting which format you want to save your files in now we look at the custom settings menu which is really where you can define your style of photography and setting the camera up to suit your requirements. The custom settings menu or pencil icon is a great area to change a lot of the camera and current settings. The first option we're gonna look at is auto focus. Here we can have a look at AFC priority. This selection gives you two options. I've selected release. What this does is tell the camera that when pressing the shutter button, if the subject is out of focus or not, it will still shoot. If you select focus, the camera will lock until it is in focus. By selecting release, it will allow you to shoot fast moving objects which may first appear out of focus whilst moving through your frame. Here are a couple of shots which I would not have been able to take without selecting this option. Next is AFS priority selection. Again, you have the same options. This time, we'll select focus. This option is used for static shots, such as landscapes, buildings, and portraits. So to summarize the two options, AFC, continuous, is for things that are moving. You want to be able to shoot things that are moving, but not relying on them being in focus before you start shooting, to give you every opportunity to capture it when it hits the peak moment, when it focuses and you capture your shot. 
This sort of method is used, for example, when you're doing panning shots. AFS is for static shots, architecture, for example, portraits, things like that. Focus tracking with lock-on is quite interesting. It's particularly useful if you are tracking a moving subject, such as a person walking down a busy street and is suddenly blocked by something else in the frame. For example, walking behind a column. If you select option one, the focus will react quickly and refocus on the new subject, basically meaning when you're original subject come back into shot, they will now be out of focus. However, if you select five, focus will remain on the original subject you'll be tracking as they pass through the shot, and then when they reappear, they should still be in focus. If you are unsure how you would like to track your subjects, I would recommend leaving this on free. AF or auto focus activation. There are two options, shutter on AF on, or AF on only. This is extremely important. If you are starting photography, I would recommend leaving this on shutter AF on. This will mean using the shutter button to act as a focus button when depressed. However, I always use AF on, which is back button focusing. This means the shutter button no longer focuses your camera. I would strongly recommend only using this option if you're comfortable shooting your camera. I will cover this in more detail in another video. Next is limit AF area mode selection. This is useful if you know there is an AF area mode that you will not use. You can disable it in this menu, basically to help you navigate a lot quicker when you're shooting. This means when you're going through your autofocus mode options, the ones you deselect will not appear. It doesn't mean they've been deleted from your camera. You can basically revisit this menu and reselect it if you wish. Now jump down to shoot and display. Here you will see continuous low shooting speed. In here you have the choice as to whether you want your camera to shoot 5 frames per second, 4, 3, 2 or 1. I leave mine in the middle as I find 3 frames is usually enough. Max continuous release limits the camera ability to continuously shoot, usually in continuous high shooting mode. This really depends on your own personal preference and how many photos you wish to take when shooting. If you're capturing, say, a fast jet or a bird for your frame, you may find selecting the maximum option is the best option. However, this means you are gonna have a lot of photographs on your memory card. We now look at exposure delay mode. Now, I find this particularly a great feature, especially when shooting long exposure shots. This allows you to select a small amount of time between pressing the shutter button and the camera actually starting to take the photograph. Why do you need this? Quite simple camera shape, camera movement, which could result in a blurred image. Now, if you don't have a remote shutter release, for example, you may find this option quite useful, especially if you're shooting landscapes or low light photography, for example, astro, things like that. But remember, if you do set this on, if you go back to shooting, say, for example, street photography or something a little bit faster, every time you click the shutter button, you are gonna get that delay, so remember to turn it off when you're finished. An important setting is apply settings to live view. Live view is your screen at the back of the camera, which basically shows you where your lens is pointing and where your focal point is. I can't really shoot without this, as the live view will show me the actual exposure whilst adjusting my settings on the camera. So, to explain a little bit more detail, if you were shooting at a higher shutter speed, let's say 10,000th of a second, and an aperture of f11, if your ISO is around 100 and the day is overcast, your photograph or your exposure is going to look very, very dark. If you do not switch this on, your camera will not give you a true reflection of what you're actually seeing, what your camera settings actually are. So when you take your photograph, the exposure is going to be extremely dark, underexposed. Now, I absolutely love this feature. I always shoot this, especially when I'm shooting landscape photography. Peaking highlights, you have two options. The peaking level allows the sensitivity of the areas that are highlighted as focused. Basically, what this does is it will highlight around the areas as you manually focus your camera, showing that those areas are now in focus. Whereas peaking highlight color allows you to select the color and show the areas that are in focus. You have a few selections here. I personally like blue. I have seen other photography in red. Mastering your camera and knowing where to find the settings within your menu 
is obviously going to make you a better photographer, but it's also going to give you the confidence to progress. The best bit of advice I can give you is if you are starting out, don't be afraid. Photography is about learning, and yes, you will make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. The key thing is learning from those mistakes and improving your technique. By doing this, it's going to open up a whole new world in how you see it. The Nikon Z7 II is my go-to camera. I'm not afraid to experiment to get the types of photographs that I want. Sometimes they work, sometimes they won't. But that's life and that is also photography. Now if you think about it, photography is magical. You have a camera, you take a picture and it captures what is in front of you. You're documenting your life. And if you want to go really, really deep with this, you are technically freezing time, which is, to be honest, absolutely mind-blowing. Join me on my journey because this is going to be amazing. I am super excited about this new channel. Can't wait to get working with this. I'm going to be working with quite a few different photographers, different levels, gaining experience from them and knowledge, but also teaching at the same time. So check back soon, guys. I've got a lot more videos planned. But for now, stay safe, toodle pit, just be happy. This photography is awesome and I love it.